Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to ARC's weekly fireside chat. This week, we will be highlighting some amazing, incredible, dynamic women for Women's History Month. Uh, we will be highlighting our staff, interns, uh, uh, members who are doing incredible work in the community at our organization. Uh, these are some powerful women. Uh, I won't be here as always, I want to make sure that we lift the voices of uh, these amazing women. And so Norma will be moderating our very own associate director of our women's and non-binary department, uh, Ms. Norma Kupian, who's, she doesn't know this, but I'm going to just share it anyway. One of my heroes, uh, she wrote, she rose. And so with that said, I'm going to hand it off to Norma. Norma, the show is yours. Uh, I'll follow up at the end of the show uh, and I'll be listening and, and, and watching. Thanks, Sam. Um, it's great to see you as always. It's great to see um, everybody here on this panel. It's been um, a tough year for us since our last women's history last year. Um, so I would like for everyone to take about a minute to introduce themselves. So let's start with Michelle Garcia. Thank you, Norma. Great to be here. Um, and I agree, you're my Shiro too. And you've made the pathway for many of us women that are on this call. So thank you for your work, Norma. Um, my name is Michelle Garcia. I am the program coordinator for Ventura Training Center, where we do some amazing work with previously incarcerated firefighters who um, are working on a pathway to transforming their life and working um, in uh, fire careers. Cool. Thanks, Michelle. Um, what about Sean? Hello, hello. I am a life coach at ARC Sacramento, and I help our population get the navigation that they would need in order to succeed out here in life by giving them the tools, resources, and a mentorship that they would need. Thanks, Sean. And uh, Pam? Or Pamela? Thank you. Yes, my name is Pamela. I'm a life coach at the LA office. And where we I help individuals that's coming home find the resources that they need, whether if it's housing, employment, mental health, whatever it is. And I've also been a um, part of the Ride Home program, which is amazing. Ooh, we can touch on that later um, later today on the show too. Um, what about Wendy? Hi, my name is Wendy, and I am a member, and I am also the Inland Empire chapter member representative, and I also do the Ride Home program. Thank you for having me today. And Alexia. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Alexia. I'm a youth intern and community organizer with ARC. I've been with them since September, since I got out of prison. Thanks, Alexia. Um, so the one thing that, that brings us all to ARC and to the space here is that we, all of us on this panel, have been formerly incarcerated. So um, just that fact is really what, what brings us here and what really binds us together. But I would really like to hear from each of you how you survived that. Like, what, what was it that that made you able to persevere incarceration and come out to be the amazing woman that you are today. Um, so we'll hear from, let's start with Michelle again. Michelle's right on my screen. <laughs> Thank you, Norma. Um, 
just hearing the question and it is, you know, um, how I survived was a lot of you women, maybe not in particularly, but my sisters inside, they, um, they carried me, um, um, a lot of God and my family, um, just being able to know that I had that family at home waiting for me was my strength. Um, when I wanted to give up, I would continue on for them. And um, but again, the sisters inside, they were the ones that when I wasn't on the phone with my family or I couldn't make those phone calls or wasn't getting those letters. It was you sisters mm -hmm. that would carry me. Yep. That's right. Thanks, Michelle. Um, what about you, Pam? What really like to use Michelle's words? What really carried you through your incarceration? And what carried me was was um, trying to make it home to my family and you know, see my nephews grow up to be the young men that they are today. And since since my um since coming home, what really my drive was seeing all you ladies out here doing the damn thing, and I didn't want to be left behind. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of work to be done out here, and I I'll never forget where I come from. And the the women inside, that's why I do the things that I do now, and becoming a life coach. I want to be that vessel for them for when they come home, they have, you know, at least somebody they can, they can, they can feel comfortable with, with their re-entry. Thanks, Pam. And Sean? My motivation was just knowing that I knew one day that I would get out and I would um, go on and do great things, but I didn't know how to step outside of myself. So once I started, mm -hmm. um, taking heed and uh, actually applying these mini groups that I had took throughout the years uh, to my everyday life. And that's what allowed me the chance to get out. Um, and getting out here, what motivated me is just knowing that I can be a voice to so many different women that are out here that are really trying to navigate through this because it's difficult to be out here. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they put me in a place where um, I didn't know anyone. And so it was hard for me to navigate. And so I want to show people um, how to navigate without anyone and just mm -hmm. learning how to balance life and um, be able to um, find that um, that sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thanks. Thanks, Sean. What about you, Wendy? My story is just a little different because uh, prior to going in, I was completely broken from domestic violence. And I mean, for me, there was like no, there wasn't much further that I could go down. And uh, I ended up finding my bunkie hanging in my cell. And I knew that day, and I saved her life, but I knew that day that was a turning point for me because I knew I didn't want to be that hopeless, that I didn't see any other way out. I knew that I needed to find a way to heal from the inside out, right? Not just superficially. I needed to really heal all the traumas and stuff that had happened to me. And I just started putting one foot in front of the other and started engaging in all the, the programs that I was able to find. Um, ARC happens to be one of them. And once I got out, I continued to stay in touch and have just been hitting the ground running ever since. <clears throat> Thanks for that, Wendy. And then what about Alexia? How did you get through your incarceration, Alexia? So I got through with just a lot of prayer and hope and faith, um, strong support system, through family, finding at least one or two good people around you that will help you get through it, that understand you. Um, just a lot of perseverance, I'd say. Wow. Thanks, Alexia. So listening to all of you guys, um, all of you women talk today, I heard a lot of talk about community, about mm -hmm. unconditional love, a sense of belonging, healing, and how Alexia put it, just a couple of people. She just needed a couple of people in her corner mm -hmm. to survive what she went through. And so I, I, I want to know too from you guys, what about women's re-entry? Like, how is that different? Like, I even feel that our answers right now are probably a little different from what the men would say. Um, so, <laughs> Pam's all. <laughs> um, 
But so what are you guys like just thinking about like what helped you get through and the the subjects that we talked that we touched on right now? What do you think that women need to re-enter? Like what are their special needs that we have that you guys think that we need that we can give to other women coming home and supporting them? I think one of the really unique things about us is um, we all like in some ways we need a lot of the same things, but we also like all have our own individuals, you know, um, for me, myself, um, my biggest struggle was coming from X31857 back to being a mom again. I didn't know how to do that. And I didn't want to be that old person that landed me in prison. And so I thought I had to run from her, but it turns out, mm -hmm. you know, I'm it's I'm that same person. I just didn't want to make those same mistakes again. And um, but there's there was no um, re-entry class that told me, mm. Michelle, you've been gone for six years. Your daughter's not going to want you to brush your hair anymore. It's not because she doesn't love you. It's because she learned to do that without you. But when I got home, I heard my daughter say, no, mom, I don't want you to brush my hair. I heard. I don't love you. I'm mad at you. You were gone, you know, so that it is, it's just one little struggle. And, and just look at how men come home. They come home pretty ripped, right? They're in shape. They're tough. And I don't know about you women, but I didn't come home tough. And I paroled from fire camp after fighting fires and climbing hills for almost two years. I was still like 40 pounds overweight, which wasn't the end of the world, but it, it took some getting used to. I, I didn't even know how to use the round brush to blow dry my hair anymore because you don't get round brushes and blow dryers, right? So it was just an adaption that I wasn't expecting. Um, um, for me, that that's what you know, and it's not all my struggles, but just a few things that I think are different. Yeah, that's go ahead, Sean. Um, I'll go. Um, I think um, things that are different, um, women versus men, is the fact that um, we have been through a lot of difficulties <clears throat> with life, um, our experiences, um, being, being a uh, um being a uh, victim of cat calls mm. and um, fat shaming and um, looked upon as sex, sex objects um, and getting out here and just knowing that, hey, I'm, I'm human and I just want to live my life. And then there are people like, there's no one to talk to out here. You know, you go to people and try to share with them your problems and there's no one that can relate to you and your issues. Just being able to uh, have that sense of belonging, as I said before, in a community where that fully understands who you are as a human being, but a woman first. Thank you for that, Sean. Um, Pam? Yeah, I agree with you, Sean. So um, men and women, we have the same needs. However, men have it easy. You know what I'm saying? They can come home and, you know, hook up with a woman like that and, and all they need is to take care of. For me, um, I had to come out to learn how to be a grown up because, mm -hmm. you know, I've been incarcerated. My first time I went in at, at 18. So I never lived on my own or any of that. My mom, like, basically did everything for me. So going to prison at the age of 23 with a life sentence, I had to come home and, and, and learn how to be a grown up and live on my own. So and then learning technology, that was like a, a struggle for me because I didn't know how to work a cell phone. I only didn't know how to work a computer and everything is by technology. So we need more um, when, when individuals come home that haven't took advantage of um computer literacy classes in there to have like computer classes set up out here for individuals because when, when us as life coaches we get new members coming home that don't know how to work a cell phone or how to set up a zoom so those need to be set in place for them as well mm -hmm. yeah so wendy what about you what do you, how do you feel that women um re-entry is different from a man's uh, well, for me, I mean, when men are in the, 
a lot of times the women are home with the kids taking care of them and also running for their men, right? But when women are in and their kids are in foster care like mine were, and my children were with their dad, uh, I was sending letters all the time. And it wasn't until I got out and about six months after being out that my daughter and I had found out that uh, the social worker had been keeping all of my letters in a box because she had decided that it wasn't good for her. And um, I feel like there should be more access to women and even men being able to stay in connection with their children. You know, it really rubbed me the wrong way to think that this lady thought she knew what was best because my daughter thought I hadn't, she thought I had fallen off the face of the earth. But when my daughter turned 18 and hit her up about it. She went into the drawer and pulled out her box and there were all the letters and everything that I had sent. Mm. And I feel like I'm tired of the system thinking that they know what's right for us, right? Not only that, we're being put, especially lifers, you know, they're, they're coming out into programs where people are coming off the streets from drug issues. And they think that the life skills are the things that those lifers need. And that's not the truth because they've done all those things to get home. Mm -hmm. they, don't. they need specific classes that will help that like real life skills exactly what she's talking about mm. technology i'll never forget taking a lady who did 31 years to the parole office and she stood in front of a at jack in the box she stood in front of a machine that was an electric uh drink machine mm -hmm. and she became so embarrassed because she didn't know how to make the thing work because it was just push buttons <laughs> and the simplest things right humiliate us and shame yeah. us when if somebody could just be kind enough to think about the simple things and like guide us, you know, because we don't want to be ashamed. We want to be mom and we want to be a daughter and we want to learn how to do all those things. And we want to do it with pride. And we don't feel that way when we come out into this space. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Thank Wendy. You. Um, Alexi, I, I wanted to make sure you have space to talk. Mm -hmm. I feel like you're our newest member of our, our, our girl circle. Um, how do you feel? How did you feel about reentry? Especially oh, I, a young woman. I definitely identify with Michelle, like coming home, going through my closet, not fitting anything. I just felt like, <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, I felt discouraged. Um, felt like I didn't know like how to work the new phone. There was no a uh, home button. You had a slide. I didn't know a lot of stuff and the new Alexa <clears throat> machines that are out. And I just felt like like not worthy of and for me i want to do everything on my own so for me it was just like accepting the the help that my family wanted to give me the give me things because i'm like a, no i got it I can do it and it's just like learning to to take in the compassion and help that people want to give you thank you alexia um so listening to all of you, I, f I feel like everybody said that their re-entry had something to do with dignity, some sort of dignity, either dignity with your with your family, you know, dignity like walking out of prison, um, dignity in how you related to your kids, or how you, that you wanted dignity while you were learning to figure out a computer. And then when I also look at this panel, I see that each of you is actually working in a place to give people dignity. And so I wanted to just hear from all of you about what you do, like your jobs. I don't think our audience knows. I mean, they know how amazing you guys are, but I don't know if they know like everything I know. Um, so I, I just wanna hear about you, about how um, you understand about dignity and, and men and women's dignity looks different, but also how you're giving that dignity to others. So in, you're doing it by your jobs, your positions that you're in. You're doing it by being life coaches, by creating policy, by facilitating um, chapters. You're you're all giving dignity to to our people. And so I, I would just like to hear from all of you guys about your jobs and how you're you're giving that dignity back to folks. Who wants to start, Michelle? Um, my job is, is very fortunate. I love my job. Um, I'm at Ventura Training Center. Um, 
However, I think my greatest joy of giving back is going back um, to the women, even if it's as a volunteer. Um, that That's where I really like to focus my uh, giving back um, because I want them to be prepared. I don't want them to be as shocked as I was to re-entry. Um, I can't always make it better for them, but I can at least tell them, you know, this is my story. Um, as far as giving back dignity here as my job, um, it's, you know what, I don't have to help them build dignity. These guys just, they do it on their own. They show the world. Um, and I just get to sit back and watch it. Um, we, you know, they are an amazing example of uh, humanization, right? Um, people, yeah. you know, want to cast them away and throw away the key, but yet a fire season goes through and they're heroes, right? You know, and it's like, <laughs> right. you know, I get to sit there and say, hey, those heroes now, they were the ones you wanted to throw away a couple of years ago, you know? So can you, um, can you tell people what exactly VTC is? I'm not sure everybody knows. Just a little. Yes, absolutely. At the, um, so Ventura Training Center is a, a first of its kind, unique program that takes previously incarcerated firefighters and helps them build um, careers and transform their lives to build careers as firefighters. With um, We have uh, over 30 men who have left our program that are working with Cal Fire right now um, and other positions in uh, careers. So that is what we do at Ventura Training Center. And we just welcomed this morning class nine to um, an ARC. Just got to spend the, the first four hours with them this morning in orientation, orientation, sharing the community that we bring. And how exciting is that, that it's a, a program where people incarcerated um, are fighting fires and that the, the lead person out there is a woman who also fought fires while she was incarcerated. Like, how amazing is that? Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, Norma. She's like, it's, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, I thought about that too. It's pretty cool. <laughs> it is pretty cool. Like just this morning, just was like, yeah, I know about the chainsaw. And they're like, yeah. <laughs> I get to say I paroled from Malibu. Oh, you're bougie. <laughs> okay, all right. You're bougie. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Thanks so much, Michelle. And then Pam, what about you? I, I know you're doing a lot of work in the Los Angeles office as a life coach, but you, you also have, you wear a couple of other hats too. Um, you, you do the ride home. You are also on panels. So do you want to tell us a little bit about how you um, support people coming home with dignity? Yeah. Um, well, I was afforded the opportunity to have a wonderful life coach coming home, which would have been you, Norma. And um, <laughs> I was like, who? You. So you gave me my the opportunity to get my second employment since coming home. And um, Michelle, I want to I, I, I praise you. Because when when Carlos picked me up on the ride home program, he didn't know what to do with me. And so he called you. And <laughs> <laughs> I was amazed at because I didn't know what size I wore anything. And you looked me up and down and you was like, oh, you this size, you that size. I'm going to get you this. I'm going to get you that. Everything you picked out for me was right on point. And you taught me a valuable lesson for when I do the ride home program to be able to know what the women needs are by looking at them and, <laughs> and affording them the same opportunity that you did for me. And, you know, seeing the women's expression, the ones that don't know that I'm even, that didn't know I was home and to, mm -hmm. to, to be able to go and pick them up, to see the expression on their face was like breathtaking for me. You know, that, that was just a wonderful experience. I love giving back and showing the women that they are, you know, wonderful and they have a good connection by becoming a member of ARC. And I just love giving back, you know, and like you said that I am, I wear many hats, you know, but um, I just want to learn everything I can to be able to, for the women to come home to show them the way. Thanks, Pam. Can you tell us a little bit about the Ride Home program in case people who are listening don't know what that is? Oh, yes. Yeah. So the Ride Home program is um, we give rides home to individuals coming home that need a ride and we um, afford them with whatever they need. They um, We 
you know, give them a meal. So I ask them like, what do you want to eat? You know, <laughs> and when they say like burger, I'm like, really? What have you been craving for this whole time while you've been in prison? So we give them a meal, we take them shopping, you know, and then we take them. <laughs> Our favorite. Yeah, to visit with their family. Um, Michelle was so cute because when she took me to go see my mom, she was like, you're not going to AWOL on me, are you? <laughs> and I'm like, no. Like, like she was a bounty hunter instead of a, a ride home pickup. <laughs> yeah. So we just try and make it a wonderful experience that they will never forget. And we also take lots of pictures mm. for, you know, our memories. Things yeah. I hate. So with the Ride Home Program, individuals right here and let us know when they're coming home and that they need a ride home. So we have that date in mind and then we find someone that is available to go and, and pick them up. That's open to men and women. Yes. Men and and shout women. out to Carlos, even though he's not yes. a female. He That program is everything because of that man. So yes. I just want to give him a shout out to Carlos. He's awesome. He sat in the parking lot mm -hmm. for overnight waiting on me to get out. Oh, yes. Carlos is awesome. He doesn't know how to pick out clothes, but he's also no. he does other stuff. He also makes tacos really good. And look, we went to, I think it was Target we went to, and it was so huge that I was like just stuck. And he was like, go ahead. Like, yeah. Yeah. and I didn't know what to do. I was scared. So I was like stuck at his hip. I would not move. I was scared to move. And then Michelle showed up. And I just felt comfortable, you know. Yeah, because that's, that's a, yeah. Uh, very, very male. He's like, go, go. Yes. We're all like, what are you going to get? What are you looking at? Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? What about that color? Like, we're, yeah, we're very into it. I would have yeah. been, like, super excited. Um, so, Wendy, what about you? How do you um, give people, give back to people coming home in your Either, I don't know what you want to tell us about your chapter stuff, your UCLA stuff. Uh, well, first of all, I, I do want to say that I want to acknowledge you and I want to acknowledge Lily because um, there there was a woman's housing with ARC eight years back, six years back, and, and it didn't work out. And Lily kept like, you know, we need to have another woman's housing. And I was the first woman to open that. And I was literally on the streets, um, but I had chose that I had made a decision that I was not going to go back to my old life or to my old friends. So I was sleeping in my car, I was sleeping on my brother's couch and um, she pushed for that, you know, and I, and for me, that was somebody fighting for my dignity, right? Because they didn't want me sleeping in my car and they knew I was trying to not be that old person, you know, and, and they knew that I was striving for different and she kept pushing and, and today they still have housing, you know, because of her. And we have a women's program because of you, Norma, because you have been advocating from the beginning saying that, you know, we need more services for women. And so now we have a women's group and uh, we actually had a women's retreat and would have had a second one if COVID hadn't happened. But for me, so I'm a, um, I'm an alumni of the Prison Arts Collective, which was an art program that was in, and I came out and spoke with them for a while, and then I was uh, asked to be an advisory board member, and now I'm actually a special consultant on women's programming for San Diego State University, and the reason that I do that is because it is super important that we understand that women and men are different, and that the curriculum doesn't always go across the board. Mm. Right. And the things that we are sharing with men and, and this, I mean, I can kind of just give an example, but we had this art project where they had a mom holding her baby. And for men, you know, that may be something that they can draw. But for me, I felt like these women are locked in. They have no phone calls. They have no family visits. They can't talk to their kids. And we're sending them an art project that shows them holding a child. And it's like, I believe that at sometimes we should be taking them out of their pain instead of further into it, right? So just small things that we can hold responsible as as people who are trying to let women like live, live with dignity and help them feel important because I know that when I needed it, there were women there for me and I was not a person that had a lot of women in my life, you know? I, I mm -hmm. wasn't and now I find that I cannot live without the women in my life because all of us have come to this place of empowering each other 
And I think that's what makes us all grow into the positions and do the things that we do now because we have each other. Mm. Yep. 100, Wendy. Um, thank you for that. Um, well, I'll just remind myself to talk about housing, but um, Sean, what about you? I know you're doing incredible stuff in Sacramento where it's, it's really needed and you are constantly advocating for folks up there to have more resources. And you also run the She Cares meeting and a lot of the other groups at ARC. So would you tell us how in your work, you work for others' dignity? Yes. Um, so I have been able to do many things since I have uh, gotten out of prison. And so I have been able to um, facilitate a group within um, our Sacramento County Jail for women. And so I have been able to communicate with them and being able to um, touch bases with them about their needs and being able to um, reach back to them once they get out. And so I'm able to navigate and help them through life. Um, also, I run a, a curriculum in CCWF that I'm doing right now. And so I give back to the, to, to the women as well in there. Um, I have been allotted uh, many different opportunities since I have been out advocating I have advocated for Prop um, 17, which allots um, parolees the chance to vote. And so I have been able to um, just um, be an intricate part of my community and uh, being able to um, uh, advocate for my people in the way that I see fit. Um, I have also been able to um, been blessed to been able to go into the institutions um, and uh, motivational speak and give hope and inspiration to the many different women that are incarcerated. Um, and I'm just grateful that um, doors have been opening for me. And so um, I'm just blessed to give back to my community and I will continue to do so. I also um, participate in the Ride Home program where I go um, pick up um, men and women alike. But my um, my goal is to do more women and to show them, you know, just kind of help them navigate as far as learning how to use their phone and um, do mm -hmm. things such as that and learning how women bra sizes. Like we've been locked down for so long. <laughs> women don't even know their own bra sizes. I so, know, right? Right, right. So being able to um, give them like, hey, this is how you go about it. So being able to help them through that process has been rewarding for me. And also outside of that, I do so many things for the women. Like I go out and if I know somebody getting out, I will reach out to them and give them some money and, and try to help them navigate. And so that's just my thing since I have been out. Thanks, Sean. I forgot about the bra size thing. You're like, what size am I really? Like or all, the different, all the different cuts of underwear. I swear there was only yeah. five when I went in and 150 mm -hmm. when I came out. Right. Um, Alexia, what about you? I, I know about some of your work with the policy team, but uh, can you share with us some of the policy that you're involved in that um, works to give people dignity? Yes. So um, I'm a youth advocate and community organizer. So we do a lot of stuff, but a few of the stuff we're doing right now is um, so Governor Newsom passed the bill to close all youth uh, prisons and probations pushing for an alternative, which would be the compound, which would be just like another worse prison, actually. So what we try to do is um, look for alternatives. We have a youth justice reimagine um, um, report that we want to push through that works for alternatives other than incarceration to promote youth to have success, to change their life. Uh, systems just aren't working, so we really push for that. We meet up, um, we practice public comment, we show up to spaces, we voice our opinions. Uh, all the youth that I work with, we show up and do that, and it's very powerful because we have direct experience um, in the system, so we're really just trying to change the way that the system is working. And then um, 
And we're, ARC is also a part of the LA Youth Uprising Coalition. So I co-facilitate um, a youth leadership space there. So a bunch of the youth come on and we just practice our leadership skills and our advocacy skills. And, um, just trying to change <clears throat> the world. Trying to change the world, it sounds like, Alexis. Alexis yeah. You are amazing. Thank you. <laughs> right. she's, she's kind of like I awesome. feel like not not everybody like has has met you yet. So I'm really glad yeah. that yeah. everyone got to hear you talk. Yeah, I know. I also just found out about her a couple of weeks ago. That's right. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? What's going on? <laughs> um, okay, so let's like switch gears a little bit and let's. Can I ask something, Norma? Of course. Oh, I love to hear from Pam. Okay, so I just wanted to add that I also facilitate healthy relationships, which is very important for individuals coming home because. You know, coming home, even though we have family, our family really don't know us because we've been gone for so long. The people that we did time with know us better than our own family. So mm -hmm. I teach healthy relationships so that um, people can 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 have that that um, experience of being able to know how to have a healthy relationship with family members as well as friends and have boundaries set. Mm -hmm. So I, do, I did want to add that. Mm -hmm. And what time is your healthy relationship class? Wednesdays, four thirty to five thirty. Thank you, Pam. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about um, how it felt coming home. Um, if so, start to kind of like think about um, either something that like really affected you, or something that made you incredibly happy, or just like a, it could even be like a funny like incident, like. I'll, okay, I'll, I'll like tell you mine. You know, I, you know, I always got a funny incident happening. Um, I used to be really nervous of ATMs, and I I think they were there before I left. But I don't. It would freak they me were. out, and I would put my card in, and I would ask for twenty dollars. And it was like there's like a few seconds where it says take your money, and there was nothing there. And it was like three or four seconds and I would just be like super scared and like freaking out. And then I would just down there because there's like people there and I'm like, oh my God, like I really need that 20 bucks. Like, how am I going to make up for this $20? Like I really need the $20. And then it would pop out and I'm like, oh, thank God. Like it worked again. Like, oh my God, I can't believe it worked again. You know, I was like so happy to get my $20. And I think about that sometimes about like, I, and I, I feel like I give people because what because I'm such a like ah um because uh like when I see people kind of driving like a little old lady I was like I wonder if she just got out <laughs> or <laughs> I go oh maybe she doesn't know to use her phone because she just got out oh poor little girl oh poor thing so I I kind of have like tried to turn it around and giving people a more space because I was such a like wackadoodle but what about you guys what are some like funny experiences that happen or good, good experiences that happen when you came home. The, Pam. Oh, oh, I love hearing from Pam. Okay. So mine would be the elevator and it just happened to be like last week. So <laughs> <laughs> it's still happening, Pam. It's still happening. I know. I, I, I'm going to get it together. So, you know, we get in the elevator and um, we just standing there. Matter of fact, it was Lele. <laughs> Lele. Okay. Christina. Oh, oh, yeah. Alexander. So it was me and her. We was in the elevator and we just standing there talking and chatting and the elevator opened up and we still on the ground floor. Like when we first came <laughs> in, we just like, really? You got to remember to push the button in order to go up or down. And I still do that sometimes. Like it's just going to magically take me wherever I need to go. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yes. And and the debit card. So when my first time going to the grocery store with the EBT card, we um we getting ready to pay for our food. And so I hand it to the lady and Lele, once again, she like, no. She started laughing. She like, you have to swipe it. And I'm like, swipe what? I don't know how to do anything. So she like, you have to excuse my friend, but she just got out of prison and she don't know how to use the um debit card. So then they showed me how to do it. But that was like embarrassing because the lady like, why are you handing me that? And you know, I had to yeah. let her know where I came from. 
But yeah, those are two experiences for me. See, if I was behind you in line, I would have been like, oh, she just got out. Yeah, I would have been like, oh, I would have tried to cover for you or something. Yes. I can recognize it now when I see mm -hmm. other people. So. Mm -hmm. Yep, me too. Mm -hmm. um, who else has a, something about when they came home that was like shocking? Oh, Alexia. Uh, well, sure. Um, okay. These two incidents happened the same day I got out. So <laughs> first one is I get in the car and my mom hands me her iPhone and I don't know, I'm playing with it. And then I'm trying to go to the home place, but there's no button on the new iPhones. It's just the screen. So I'm like, how do I go home? Like, where do I press the button? And she's like, you swipe up. That's how you get home. And I'm like, oh, I feel so dumb because my iPhone before I went in obviously had the home button. Yeah. And then like five, 10 minutes later, we're driving and she's like, oh, do you want to go to Starbucks? Like you're out for Starbucks, whatever. So I'm like, yeah, sure. And then we're at a red light and then the car stops, turns off. And I'm like, why did your car turn off? Did you run out of gas or something? <laughs> and she's like, It's electrical. That's what they do when they're at the red light. So I'm like, oh, and I'm like, okay, I just feel like real out of it right now. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Thank God you're with your family, though. At least like it wasn't like, you know, like you were on a date or something. And you're yeah, like, why is your car laughter towards me? I was like the joke of the day. <laughs> yeah, you were like the joke probably for a while. I'm yeah, just for sure. <laughs> <laughs> you should have taught me something because I didn't know that about the electric cars. Yeah. Yeah. They, they turn off. You I've been out here two years now. Play it off. Yeah, you just have to play it off. Just be like, I'm not shocked that we're yeah. <laughs> without a uh, car on. Um, what about um Sean? So you know how you 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 when you leave prison, you have accumulated all this stuff from all your years, right? Yeah. So I, you know, I had all my stuff in one I have my the bigger box and I had the smaller box. Anyway, I get on the Greyhound train to, to come up here to Sacramento. Make a long story short, they uh one of my my biggest box got lost. Okay. They could not find my biggest box. And so I'm sitting up there at the train station just stressed out, okay, at the Greyhound yes. station. Oh yeah. Stressed out, and then they telling me, Well, go find uh, um, go find a cab or, or, or Uber Lyft. I didn't know nothing about this. Anyway, I go find this cab and I get in the cab and make a long story short. I'm all distraught. I cry. I boo-hoo because my whole life was in this box, right? <laughs> I cry. I just bought it. I'm, so I get in this, I get in this um, cab and then by the time I get to my destination, it was only like 10 minutes away. This man charged me $56 and I didn't know. I'm like, oh my goodness. I can't afford that. Like I got my two hundred dollars gate money. Like what? Right. <laughs> it was just so crazy. Like luckily I had a, a little cash on me, but the man ripped me off. Wow. What happened to the box though? I never, I never got that box back. It, it every, I'm telling you, I still cry about it because I'm like, I leave my whole <laughs> life in this box. Like all my certificates, my accomplishments, my goals, my everything was in this box. Phone numbers, pictures, everything. And so, yeah. So that's how you started your re-entry by losing yep. your my biggest life. important box. <laughs> wow. Life. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> Wendy, <laughs> Wendy's already so cracking up. I know because this is so just ding dong, right? But so I knew I was going to be getting out, but I also knew that like I only have my kids and my mom and my mom lived way up north. So I knew I wasn't going to have anybody to support me and I didn't have a job or money or so um, <clears throat> six months before I got out, I got my six month issue with my underwear, my socks, my bra. <laughs> you know? I kept it in a box under my under my bed because i was like i don't know what i'm gonna have you know and so i get out and and you know usually you give your stuff away right but I'm my family and everybody's like why are you taking your fan why are you taking your fan so anyway i get to this program and they're like you can't have this fan and i completely <laughs> i was like what do you mean i have to sleep with this fan on me every night or i can't breathe and I, I literally went into left field so i swear to you and this is the honest truth I kept that six month issue, I cannot tell you, for probably the first year and a half because I just had this like, I mean, a genuine fear of not knowing where I was going to be or what I was gonna have. And it sounds really like silly, but I was able, okay, I, you know, I bought some underwear and okay, you know, I got a bra, but it really was like this anxiety or this fear of knowing 
where am I going to go? I don't have a home. I have nobody here. I have no friends. And the ones I did have, I don't want. Right. Right. I, I just, and it was like that stupid fan. And so they told me I could keep the fan if I put it in a, in a paper box, you know, the, the rings, the paper come in a box. They mm -hmm. said, if you put it in the box every morning and put it away in your closet, you can use it. But I was not giving up my fan. I don't care. But either, either way, I just want to like share how I felt about the underwear and the bra because I didn't know where, and, and I was willing to use state issue. So I wouldn't be without, you know, that was like for real, but that stupid fan, I'll never forget the first conversation. I, I think out. I met you. I think I met you around the time about the fan. I feel like I remember <laughs> meeting you and you telling me about this fan. Yeah. We were, ARC was in the old, in the old location. Yeah. 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 I've known I've known Wendy since like the nineties though, but yeah. we, we don't talk about that. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what about Michelle? I think we haven't heard from Michelle. You know, I was listening because my first thought was I don't have anything funny. Um, you know, I was I, I was really overwhelmed in emotion. I I really I I struggled coming home. I cried every day. So in some ways, looking back now, I kind of think it's funny how emotional. I, like I was a neurotic mess, um, you know. So, but the the one thing I did do was um, I had. I was uh, in prison nearly six years. So one of the first lines of business was my husband was gonna take me to get my driver's license, right? Because I had been gone. So of course my driver's license wasn't good. I had to renew it, I thought. Well, because I was gone and didn't get any tickets, they renewed, automatically renewed my license. So I never did lose my driver's privileges. So I go into the DMV, like I couldn't sleep the night before. I had the letter that I had been incarcerated. I had proof of this, I had proof of that, you know, like just all my things I thought were in order. I stand in line, I go to the DMV and I'm stressed thinking I have to take a test, I have to do this, I have to do that. And I tell the lady at the counter, um, I just wanna, you know, I need to get a driver's license. And she's like looking at me like I'm crazy cause she's looking in the system saying it's still there. But I'm talking like I don't have it. She goes, you mean replace it? And I was like, no. And, and long story short, we go round and round. I'm like, I just came out of prison. Here's all my stuff. And she's just like looking at me. She's like, you just have to sign right here. Go over there. It'll be in the mail in three weeks. <laughs> that <laughs> is funny. <laughs> That's funny. It's funny now. I, don't, right. I, I went home to the, I went in the, sat in the car and cried. <laughs> Okay, that part's not funny. But I mean, like looking back, looking back. So, um, a couple yeah. of things we have not talked about: probation or parole, and mm -hmm. what that felt like. And if if who, first of all, whoever is on probation or parole right now, I'm not sure. And if maybe there's one person on here who might have just gotten off recently, and we should be celebrating. Who has the biggest smile right now? Who is like mm -hmm. twirling around? So maybe, um. We could, <laughs> who, who is it? So maybe uh, we could hear from Sean first, but then if, if anybody else, like I know, um, I know like kind of everybody's thing, but like also what uh, parole or probation was like for you after we hear from Sean and like, what could, what could be improved? So go ahead, Sean. Oh Let's man. It. How so does it feel, girl? It feels wonderful. So after 25 years and some change of having the hold on me, I did uh, 22 years behind the walls and three and a half years out here. And I am free of parole as of Tuesday. Uh, I do not have anybody over my shoulders telling me when and I, when and where to go and, and why I can't go and I don't have to do any of that. I don't have to ask nobody, nothing, no more. I am a free woman. Mm -hmm. So I am so grateful for that. Um, uh, the supervision sucks, of course, because um, they don't really do anything. You know, they always say they don't have the funding, so they don't do anything for you. Mm -hmm. um, I think my whole time um, being out, they gave me, um, let me see, they gave me a, a gift card uh, for twenty dollars twice, and they gave me um, a bus pass once. Um, that's throughout my whole entire three and a half years out. 
They have not once asked me, hey, do you need other things? Do you need clothing? Do you need, I have to I have to fend for myself the whole entire time. And so I think that the whole uh, por parole process sucks and that they need to find a better way to um, deal with our folks coming out of prison. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. Um, does, does anybody else want to talk about what it was like being on parole or what it is like or probation? Yeah, I would like to share a specific story. Uh, when I first got out, I had been in a UCLA pilot program that was in CIW. And when I got out, I had contacted Brian Bain and said, hey, and he's like, oh, we're going to have this kickoff to this fellowship. Why don't you come speak? And I ended up getting the email and I'm looking through it. And I told him, I said, I don't want to speak. I want to apply. Can I? You know, and so I did. I applied and I was chosen. I was one of the first inaugural uh, UCLA fellows. and. I didn't know what I was doing, but the bottom line is, is that I had to take, I had an ankle monitor on and I had to take a train from Upland to UCLA once a week. And it would take me 12 hours. You know, it was like, it was this big, long thing. And to make a long story short, I needed to work on this conference with the rest of the fellows that was going to be put on and I was going to be expected to be there. So I needed to spend the night, but because I had an ankle monitor, I couldn't. And my parole officer was not hearing it. She didn't, she, yeah, right. You know, nah, nah, nah. you're just, I mean, she literally sat there and told a whole bunch of the other girls one day when I wasn't there that I was taking advantage of the situation. And at that point she kind of made me mad. And I had just spoken a conference next to Scott Kernan and Albert Rebus, who was his right hand man. And so I called and I said, look, this is what I need. This is what I'm doing. And, and, uh, Mr. Fields, who was in charge of the whole program, wrote her a letter and told her this would be it would be politically incorrect to not support her in the fact that she's growing. Right. Mm. But she wanted to look at it like I was manipulating the system and that I was doing this and I was trying to spend the night and I was trying and it, and it wasn't like that. And I feel, I feel like if our parole officers really just listened to us a little bit more, right. Instead of trying to be on this, this road of, well, this is how it is. And these are the rules. She, actually got transferred off my case after that because um, she was out to get me because she felt like I had gone over her head, but I tried to deal with her first. Yeah. I tried to talk to her first and go through the chain of command. And so I just happened to speak with Scott Kernan and was able to go straight to the talk. And that of course affected, but I feel like when people are doing the things, when they're overachieving, even when they're doing things that you would never expect them to do, encourage them, right? right. Support them, give them a, you know, a, metro link pass so i wasn't having to figure out how to pay for it to get to this there's just so much there's so much lack of support from them in so many different ways but yet they're so quick to see the negative of us struggling you know in our yeah. that's absolutely true i found that to be so true also wendy thank you for sharing that um, um yeah, i think pam has something yes unlike me i volunteer for parole because I had been gone for so long, I felt like I needed the resources. You volunteered, uh, you volunteered to be on parole. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I got released under 1170D1, and they gave me time served. And so I volunteered for parole because the only way I could go into a transitional housing is if I was on probation or parole. So I volunteered, and I had I didn't have a bad experience. I had the most coolest parole officer ever um, in this world, I believe. And so um, she did give me like um, vouchers for um, clothing. She gave me gift cards. Um, she made my transitional actually um, worth, you know, she made it easy for me. And before long, I went from two, two supervisions a month to down to one. And then um, I even got off parole early. So my transition with okay. on parole was that, that took me like four years to get to that point, but that's mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. <laughs> this hurts yeah. a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're getting to um, the end of our time, but I do want to hear from you all um, about what you, what message you would send to the women inside and then some last words from you, which if those, those can be, um, together and but but also i just got a, a text from our friend mark fawcett 
who says that the women at the CCTRP, their their new La Entrada, La, is it La Entrada? I think are watching. So we want to say hi to them. And hi. Hi. If we want to be involved in ARC, we'd be happy to <laughs> invite them into this fun, uh, powerful circle of ours. Mm -hmm. so, who would like to start with what message they would send inside and their last thoughts about today's program? Wendy Bags. I will start and with that. Uh-oh. And she's frozen. The message. And oh my God, I want to say that we are to never it. Darn it. Okay. Um, she's frozen. Wendy, we're having trouble hearing you. We're going to go to Michelle. What? And we'll come back. Yeah. Okay, there. Okay. <laughs> like, oh, no. She's like, no, 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 no. She's like, I'll do anything. <laughs> okay, go ahead, no, Wendy. No, it's fine. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so I, my number one goal is to never leave those girls forgotten. I want them to know that we are out here fighting for them every single day. And with my last words, I want you guys to know that it's been a difficult day today because I watched my best friend take her last breath at 10.03 this morning. And the reason that I still came is because I need all of the women to know that we are here for you, even through thick and thin. Even through thick and thin, it was important for me to be here for you guys, period. And that's, we are all here for you, no matter what. Thank you, Wendy. Thanks for being here too. Mm -hmm. um, Michelle? Um, I would, I would tell them the same, you know, we're here for you. We're fighting for you. Never give up. But, um, that we, um, there's more than to the words that we're here for you. Like we really are holding you. Um, when all this happened with COVID, all of us ladies, many of us that are on this phone, uh, on this screen right here and many others all pulled together and we all did what we had to do independently, you know, um, collectively, whatever it was to let them know that they were supported and they were loved. Um, but I think, you know, in closing, I would just say that um, being separated from my family was probably the worst pain and inflicted trauma that I've ever endured. Um, and so I want to take that pain and I want to use it for good. And um I want to be there for the women and my sisters, whether I know them or not, and um, just see them shine and come out and be on screens like this, working with us and being a part of us and um, giving back. I mean, it's just so the full circle with Pamela, you know, picking her up, helping her choose these bras at Target and, and, and dropping her off and sitting in the car of, you know, new way of life in the parking lot, you know, just giving our promises and our vows to each other. And my words to her was, this is really going to suck and it's going to be hard, but you got it. And we're going to get it through it together and look at her, you know? So that's what I'm going to say in closing. Don't give up ladies. Don't give up. Pam. Thank you, Michelle. Yes. I want to say um, for the women that's, um, inside men and women um, to just stay strong and know that you have a, a, a team of individuals out here that is fighting for you and um, just keep your head up and you know we are your family whether you know us or not and we're going to be there for you just come out here and you know put in the work and you know you'll be all right thanks Pam Sean just let our women know that you are not alone, that there are people out here really, really striving for you to succeed outside the walls and that we're creating programs in order to help you. So when you do get out, that you'll have a supportive system. Um, also that we really, really care for you. And just know that I know that when I when I was doing time and when I was hearing about people getting out, they didn't have any programs such as this fighting and going hard for them. Now we got people and we got communities out here really, really going hard for our people. So we're going to continue to do that and just know, hey, we there and that we believe that you 
you deserve another chance. Just like we all got another chance. Yes. So. Thanks, John. Alexia? Yeah, I'll say something. Um, I actually paroled from a CCTRP in San Diego, so that's awesome that they're watching. Um, I just want to say don't give up. Stay strong. It's easier said than done, for sure. Um, I'm yeah. kind of fresh out, so I still have those feelings in me that I can identify with, but just keep pushing, and, you know, even when you feel lost, just keep the faith and you'll find your way. I didn't know what I was going to do when I got out. I would have never imagined this, but just staying strong and faithful is all you got to do. Absolutely. Thank you, Alexia. And um, we are at one o'clock. Um, not sure how this works. If I'm supposed to close it out, so I'm like, hmm. Oh. <laughs> oh, Sam. I was like, to hand it to me, Norma. <laughs> I thought I could buy dance or something. I was like, I don't know what I do at this point. Yeah. Thank you, Norma. That's all, <laughs> folks. You, like, and now I hand it back to Sam. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so I want to thank each and every one of you uh, for both the power, compassion, and love that you brought uh, to our audience, and more importantly, to our sisters and, and, and people that are inside. Uh, for them to know that they have leaders and fearless fighters like you out here right and so many others that support the work that we're doing i think is vitally important uh not that for, for everybody in that that's incarcerated but particularly uh in in ccwf and ciw Folsom's close is empty now correct so so just so so they know like there you have an army out here uh you can consider uh, uh these women here as the spear of the tip the vanguard and so just know that uh, the fight will not stop. The advocacy will not stop. And all of the work that is being put in to bring you home and to make the place that you're at better, uh, more humane and safer uh, is, is always going to go forward. Uh, I stand with my sisters. I stand behind them on the side, side of them, wherever they tell me to stand when they're marching. Uh, just know that they have 100 percent support of everything uh, that, that we have to be able to help. Uh, again, I want to thank all of your incre these incredible uh, young women. Yes, Pam. Can we get Norma's closing thoughts? Uh, well, Norma invited me back in, and we're okay. go ahead, Norma. Okay, I, my closing thoughts to the women inside is take advantage of every program you possibly can. You have no idea how it's going to help you when you're out here. You would think that it wouldn't apply and you will be able to have conversations with people. You'll be able to celebrate other cultures, um, celebrate other people. Just do everything that you can to get out of that cell and to be in community with others because you're going to miss it when you come out here. So thank you, Sam. Thank you, everybody. You guys were brilliant. I already knew that. Um, I know everybody personally. I know how amazing they are. I'm so glad you were able to know how amazing they are also. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, God bless. God bless. And so uh, thank you. Uh, what an amazing group of women. Uh, next week, uh, we'll be welcoming to the show, drum roll, please. Uh, the Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, CDCR Secretary of uh, Corrections, Kathleen Allison, who will answer questions our community has about our community members on the inside. So uh, let everyone know uh, the Secretary of Corrections uh, will be on our show again next week. And we have a list of questions that we've uh, generated from people within our community, from our members and from our staff uh, to ask the Secretary. So until next week, please, until next week, please take care, stay safe, and see you then. <laughs>